Hello all of you little demons, Jules here for WhatCoach.com, and yes, you have read the title, it is time for another Not List, aka an episode of These Things Suck, a format where I and my neck vein Jeremy take a whistle-stop tour around the video game industry and find things that just make us say, who boy am I annoyed, and then make videos about them for your entertainment. You are very, very welcome. And today, we're talking about an absolute Dinger in the form of video game final bosses. But wait, what's that? I hear you cry. Jules, you've already done this topic? Well, I can do it again, mate, because there's enough absolute dirge for me to make more content for you lovely people. And trust me, the ones that I've dug up today, well, they are so disgusting that maybe they should have been remain buried. That's on me. That's on me. Okay, hold my hands up. That's on me. As sometimes in a video game, you're promised a delicious last course of a final boss, but are only served up a deep-fried tissue that is most definitely used. And it's hard not to feel personally slighted when this happens, because you've spent upwards of 40 to 50 hours in which you were the driving factor and thus likely have built a firm connection between the main protagonist and your own projected sense of identity. So now we're going to masticate on that meal that I've just mentioned and pray to God that it was actually snot and not some other bodily fluid that was on it. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and yes, <laughs> these video game final bosses suck. So we kick off today's not list by looking at, well, what is essentially a double whammy of disappointment, and it comes at the end of Star Fox Adventures, a game that uh, most fans of the Star Fox franchise would uh, look you in the eye and just say, we don't fucking talk about that game. And it's even worse because these two bosses in question were treated with about as much respect as a doormat exclusively used to smear dog feces on. And in fact, the final final boss of this game was absolutely muted beyond all recognition. I wonder if it's the same dog. I'm speaking, of course, about the dual final boss fight of Star Fox Adventures in which Fox has to take on both General Scales as well as mainstay antagonist Andros in the final moments. And if this all sounds like a brilliant way to cap off a less than mediocre game, well, my friend, you know the expression, things can always get worse? Well, this is the worse. To begin with, the battle against General Scales is one that you literally cannot lose, and I don't mean that in a cute way like a, oh, it's so easy that you'll breeze right through it, I mean in a straight up sense where the General doesn't attack you once, and if you so much as hit him a single time with your staff, the fight is over and he's subbed out for Andros. He's like this, he's like, oh, I'm gonna get ya, oh, I'm gonna get ya, oh, I'm gonna get ya, and you're just like, well, go on then, get me. Oh, well, don't, don't you tempt me, mate. Don't you tempt me. I, I've got a poker right here with your name on it. I'm, I'm going to write, write your will. Pay the bill. Foot the bill to you. Send a pink slip to your soul. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Right. Come on, then. Ah. I'm not cut out for this life, am I? I wanted to be a poet. I mean, talk about being chucked out with the bathwater, because just like that, the main antagonist of this game is gone just so that we can bait and switch for a boss fight that players admittedly wanted a lot more than battling this reptilian rascal, but still, very rude, right? Well, it's also a bit off that this battle with Andros sees you finally back in your ship for a dose of traditional Star Fox action, but everything here just feels a little off. For a start, the game has conditioned you to think in terms of 3D action game sensibilities, so feels more than jarring to just jump back into the cockpit, but also the battle with Andros is so unbelievably easy that it feels like there's no payoff whatsoever. Chuck in the fact that Andros's reappearance is never explained how he just came back from the dead, and you just have a sort of like one-two combo punch hit of, oh, that guy could have been good, but we completely just mm, dropped the ball with this guy, and bam! Remember this guy? <laughs> well, he's back, but in a sort of like coke light form. Sick. No thanks. Moving on! A Boy and His Blob, Trouble on Blobalonia, is a very fun title to say, but a very weird game to play. 
getting that general scales poetry going on today. In this NES classic and the recent remade version, which dropped the trouble on Blobolonia tag, more boo to you because that was the best thing about it, you play as a young lad who befriends a rather gooey alien with an overwhelming fondness for jelly beans. It is as adorable as it sounds, albeit the NES version's graphics really do look like you're befriending a portly snowman who's done one too many shrooms at Woodstock over a lovable marshmallow that was fully realized in the remake. And yes, I will address the elephant-shaped blob in the room. You can indeed hug the blob in the remake. It is the best feature. It should be in every single game. Why is it not every single game? So I hear you cry out. What is it that you actually do in this game? Well, it's hard to call the title a platformer or a puzzle game because it's a kind of weird blend of both. In fact, it should fall entirely within a new genre that we're going to term as a blob em up because that's pretty much your one solution to every challenge the game presents you. Need to smash an enemy? Blob it. Need to grab that object? Best to blob it, fam. Need a creepy body double to take your place at school while you go smoke ciggies with the sick formers behind the chemistry lab? You uh, probably need to check your priorities, my friend, but you also best believe that you can blob it. In fact, you might end up having so much blobbing fun that you may forget that the final boss battle against the Emperor in the original title is an absolute gunk of funk that is about as much fun as chewing on liposuction offcuts. Looking like one of those deep sea creatures that are turned to blancmange by rising to the surface, and with a grimace that suggests that maybe he can taste himself, the Emperor poses a threat to the player by looking at them with a mean glare and little else. I mean, Joe, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna beat his sheer glower power? <laughs> well, I guess you could just take advantage of the fact that his one weakness, aka a jar of vitamin pills, is right next to him on a seesaw that can be knocked off rather e what is the feng shui of this room what was he thinking standing next to his one and only weakness less feng shui more go fung yourself mate talk about poor placement my dude and just like that the battle is over and you're left feeling very confused and likely more than a little disappointed with this encounter <sighs> isaac frost isaac Frost. If there was ever a name to put the chilliest of williest up my spine, outside of Mike Tyson absolutely biting my ear off and then asking if I've seen his tiger, then it would have to be Mr. Isaac Frost, who is hands down one of the hardest final bosses in any sports game, boxing or otherwise, ever. Dogging you throughout the main story in a manner not too dissimilar to Handsome Jack and his constant tauntings, come the final bout with Frost, you'll be wanting to ditch the gloves and mouth guard just so you can claw his stupid face off and have a nibble on his shins. However, to claim any moment of catharsis against him, you'll need to not only just be on top of your game, but also not try to snap the disc in half in sheer frustration. For Isaac Frost is less a stone-cold killer and more of an ice cream van that is repeatedly running over your ankles. In order to beat Frost, you will need to survive two gruelling rounds in which even one hit from the champ could potentially KO you entirely. And seeing as he's got near unlimited stamina in these sections, can and will keep punching you for days on end. If you so much as even grace the ropes or get cornered, you are absolutely cooked, my friend, as Frost will unleash a flurry of attacks that will see you buried. Instead, you're going to have to duck and weave across these two rounds to even earn a chance of fighting back, and even then, the deck is stacked heavily against against you. In fact, to express how difficult this is, this is less like Little Mac taking on all comers that are obviously much, much bigger than him, and more like a boxer trying to take on, I don't know, the entirety of Mount Kilimanjaro except that it's made of steroids and knives. And as you can imagine, having to panic dodge your way through the opening rounds only to be floored immediately is a situation that you will find yourself in time and time again, and having to repeat this only serves to enrage you further. The irony of a person called Frost boiling my piss this much is not something that is lost on me, nor is the amount of sleep that I have lost thinking about how much this boss battle infuriated me. Now, most video games worth their salt definitely know that while gameplay can definitely keep players invested for a fair amount of game time, it is the narrative and the through line that will pull people through to the end. Because if you have a compelling story and a truly compelling villain, then you're more likely to actually want to see them both be put to an end. 
And yet, sometimes, despite having a decent throughline and a decent villain that you can't wait to beat, there are some titles that drop the ball in the final moments, and Sniper Ghost Warrior is sure one of them. While not perhaps possessing the same polish as the Sniper Elite series, Ghost Warrior sure as hell nailed its gameplay elements where it counted, namely the ability to pop enemies' heads like grapes from a country mile away, and having a rather engaging story of a group of snipers destabling a tyrannical military regime who are now worryingly toying with nuclear weapons. It's high stakes and high tensions all the way through. And as you've been chasing the leader General Vasquez all the way through this game, the desire to land that final shot just grows and grows in your mind. It's a shame, therefore, that the final boss of this game is done and dusted within three minutes of starting the final level with one bullet and zero challenge present at all. I mean, hell, the general just stands there in an open window just pointing at a map that might as well read, this is my last will and testament, guys. I've just had it drawn up in case the worst should happen. I know that it probably won't, and I, I am just one day away from retirement, and I've just sunk a load of money into a very expensive boat to travel the world with with my family. I just know that nothing bad's going to happen to me, but I just wanted to make you all clear that it's right here just in case. Is anyone else feeling like a sort of burning on their chest, like a laser pointer just kind of like been on me for quite a while? No? Just me? Fantastic. Well, I'll keep going! And thus feels less like a test of your skills and more like you've just fallen into a point-and-click adventure title. This reeks of the general just sighing to himself and saying, let's just get this over with, which is a sentiment echoed by the game itself as it literally just ends without any cutscenes at all and just a black screen with the words, the end. Talk about shooting yourself in the foot. Now, Tom Clancy's The Division was actually one of the few military shooters that actually piqued my interest because of the fact that it had a much darker and somber apocalyptic tone, and I was like, mm, please, sign me up for the buffet. Set in a desolated Brooklyn, New York, you play as a member of The Division, who is sent in to restore order to the area after a virus has swept through, killing nearly all inhabitants and now where anarchy reigns. And by restore order, I mean shoot everything not wearing a bright purple beanie that you and your mates will inexplicably scavenged from the same trash bin. It's a perfect blend of over-the-top doom and gloom while being so tonally deaf to your own message of peace that I found so alluringly silly. However, while the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay was mostly a laugh riot with friends, come the end of the title, there was only one punchline present, and that was the game's final boss kicking all the love I had for this title to death with oversized clown shoes. I say this because instead of a grand final battle against a supervillain or against the shadowy operative leaders of the LMB, which is a private military organization in this game, you get a Juan on Juan showdown with a helicopter. Oh! I know, right? Pretty sick. If there's anything that smacks of a developer not knowing how to end their game, it is a boss battle with a faceless machine piloted by a nobody that you have zero attachment to. And to make matters worse, the battle isn't even any good, as the helicopter for some reason is rocking the kind of armour that would have Tony Stark asking for the blueprints, as this beast will shrug off not only round after round of gunfire from you and your team, but also multiple anti-air gun turrets designed exclusively to shoot things like this out of the bloody sky. What follows is a boring slog of activating the turrets, hiding underneath some scaffolding while it fires down from above, and then moving on to the next area to repeat the process, maybe shooting one or two goons in the face along the way, which again just screams to me like these mugs were only placed there to give the player something to actually do. But hilariously, there's also a second way that this boss battle can actually suck, because if you've actually gone out into the game and done a lot of grinding and leveling up with your mates and farming for loot, you may actually approach this final boss battle just going like, right, Let's see what we've got here. Brrr. Oh, it's dead. Fantastic. We did more damage than the actual turrets because we've got better loot than it. Sick. So, you can have a double whammy of either a boring slog of a boss fight or one that is so painfully easy that it makes you question what the hell the point of all of this was. Thanks, The Division. Thanks. And there we go, my friends. That was These Final Bosses Suck Again. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below, as well as put your suggestions for the next episode of this Not List format that you'd like to see next time. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ, but the O is a zero. Or you can follow Joe Johnston, who is my editor over here, who's probably put up some lovely image of himself or just something silly. 
Oh, I have no control over him. In fact, he has complete control over me and will probably splice in a few of my bloopers along the way. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate you, buddy. But yes, hope that you're doing well, my friend. And before I go, I just want to say one thing. Even though you probably see me getting over the top angry, that is just in a hyperbolical way. Like, I, I'm not actually this angry in real life and I don't actually encourage you to take anger forward because, well, it's not a very good emotion to hold on to. It's draining, it's exhausting, and it does nobody any good in the long run. So I urge you, if you have the capacity to forgive people who have wronged you in the past, or if you've made mistakes, forgive yourself, my friend, because trust me, I just want you to live a healthy and happy life, to build bridges instead of burning them, all right? So let's do that for yourself, for your neighbor, for everybody you meet in this crazy world, and let's get through this together, shall we? As I'm Jules, you have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.